Hello. Welcome, everyone. This is Wayne Roden, although it says I am Lois because Lois has the uh, Zoom platform now that we just purchased. So I just want to share just three screens with you this morning before we start with this program. And of course, you can see today's program or tonight's program is Common Landscape and Garden Pest by Wizzy Brown. And we also have, see, I can figure out how to do this. I want to thank uh, Arlene Boyer for uh, her JMG service to Frost Elementary in Georgetown ISD. She's been keeping their JMD program going all through COVID and been really having to scrounge around for some things. So thanks a lot to Arlene. If you see her, we'll congratulate her. And next month, we will have Practical Landscape Design, One Pro's Process, Part One. That'll be Colleen uh, Dieter from ATX Gardens. Okay, stop share. All right. Well, let's see how many we got. Looks like we got 55 folks on here now, and we're just getting started. So, Wizzy, if I can find you here, I'll make you co hosts so you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. You should be able to share your screen and Wizzy, go ahead and get started right away. So, thanks okay. everybody for joining us. Great. Thank you. I think everybody knows who I am by now. Hi, it's me. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> All right, so I made this kind of like really simple tonight um, because I know you guys are going to probably have questions about what you're seeing in your gardens right now. So I tried to, you know, go really simple, stupid, and then we can have a conversation. So the first thing, of course, that I'm going to talk about isn't an impact, but can certainly be an issue. Um, and those are the spider mites. So these are arachnids. They are related to spiders and they are going to be small. And depending upon the stage that they're in, as well as species, as well as your particular eyesight and how good it is or how poor it is, uh, you may or may not be able to see them. Um, but you should be able to see the damage. So spider mites are going to start their population out on the underside of the leaves. And they're going to be crawling around down there. They do have mandibles, so kind of rasping the surface of the leaf, <clears throat> excuse me, the leaf. And it kind of causes this speckling look on the foliage. And that's kind of classic spider mite. But the, the real kind of symptom is when you turn that foliage over, if you have webbing underneath the leaf, then you're certainly going to say, yeah, there's spider mites. As the population continues to grow, then they will expand the webbing to cover more parts of the plant. So they'll move on from the underside of the leaf with that webbing and start covering sections. And if you just let them go, like my neighbor years ago did, they will cover And it gets to this stage, <clears throat> excuse me, if it gets to this stage, then you really just need to kind of rip those plants out right now. Hold on a minute, I gotta get some water. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I had a Caesar salad for dinner and there's like pepper that I can feel caught in my throat and it always makes me choke and I need to, I should have chosen something else that wasn't going to bother me for dinner, but you know, hindsight's 2020. Okay, so for Management of spider mites. Here I go. <coughs> I am going to get a cough drop. <coughs> Management of spider mites. You are going to need to target where they are located. So if you're scouting, which I hope that you're doing,
to at any particular time is going to help you to catch populations before they really start getting out of hand. And it's always going to be easier to manage populations, obviously, when they're smaller. And that is smaller not only in numbers of how many you have, but also the smaller stages that they're in. <coughs> So you can use things like high pressure water sprays. You could take a pan of soapy water or alcohol, like isopropyl alcohol or something, and tap the plants over top of that and knock these things into it. You could use handheld vacuums to remove these. And of course, you know, vacuums and high pressure water sprays are really going to be dependent upon what type of plant you're using that on. If it's a really delicate plant or something like that, then you might not want to go with that because obviously you don't want to completely destroy your plant trying to remove some uh, insects or mites that might be causing just a little bit of problem. So when we go to chemical controls for spider mites, then you can go to insecticidal soap. That's probably the first thing that I would go to. There's not going to be a long residual with an insecticidal soap. So essentially, you're going to have to really direct that spray to where those mites are located. So targeting the underside of the leaf. If you spray the upper surface and they're not on that, it's not going to kill them. You can also use horticultural oils on spider mites. And these are going to be present you know, spring through fall. But most people really, really start noticing spider mite populations when it gets really hot out, so July and August. So in those months, you don't necessarily want to use the horticultural oils because that could damage the plant further because that oil can cause the plant to not be able to open the stomata and respire the way that it should. But if you're talking about cooler times of the year, where you're catching the population when it's first starting, then that's when horticultural oil really can come in and play a um, to kill these off. There are also botanical products that you can utilize, um, things like azadiractin, which is known as neem. Um, you could also use spinosad on these, which really works. On, that's not a botanical, but it's a natural product. Um, it's going to work well on things that kind of chew foliage. So the spinosad would actually be consumed by these mites and you can actually use that. Pyrethrum is another botanical that you could use. It is a less toxic product or a low impact product, but it is broad spectrum. So you will kill your beneficials if they come into contact with that product as well. Grasshoppers and katydids, I think everybody knows what these look like. They have large mandibles and chewing mouth parts, and these are going to cause damage in both the immature and adult, st adult stages. Oh my goodness, I am so sorry. <coughs> so your damage here is going to, again, be dependent upon the size of the insect that you're dealing with. So any type of chewing pest, <coughs> any type of chewing pest, the damage is going to vary dependent upon how large that insect is. So if you think about little tea tiny um, grasshoppers that just emerged out of the egg, and, but this would also go for, you know, caterpillars or leaf feeding beetles or whatever. So those insects that are first out of the egg, they're TT tiny, they have TT tiny mandibles. And so they're only going to be able to eat the really tender parts of the plant. And so a lot of times there, they'll just eat the surface of the foliage and you kind of get this stained glass or window painting effect on the plant. Then when you start getting into the more like medium-sized stuff, 
then they're going to start chewing holes in the plant. So you see some damage that looks like this in the picture. And then when we get into like the big ginormous caterpillars, think like tomato hornworms or full grown grasshoppers or katydids, they're going to eat whatever they want. They'll eat foliage, they'll eat flowers, they'll eat fruit sometimes, and they just kind of you know, leave whatever they don't want behind, but they can't eat anything. So this is one of those, again, they're going to be present from spring through fall. So it's going to be easier to kill them earlier in the year. So not only is it easier because those immature grasshoppers and katydids are smaller, but they don't have wings yet, so they can't fly away from whatever you're trying to do to kill them. So it's going to be easier in both regards. So when we're dealing with these, again, scouting is going to be important, making sure that you're actually looking and getting them in the immature stage. A lot of people, they send me pictures of immature grasshoppers and they're like, oh, I don't want to kill it. It's so cute. <coughs> I get it but they turn into adults and they can really do some damage at that stage. So you really need to kind of make that decision as to if you're okay with them damaging your plants even more later on. So as far as, <coughs> all right, I think I might've gotten the pepper dislodged at that point. Um, as far as managing these, you can try to use row cover. That's going to work on the immature stages. But if the adults are really hungry or really want whatever you're covering up, they can chew through row, row cover. So that can be problematic if you are, again, trying to treat the adult stages. Um, as far as chemical controls, there is a bait that you can utilize. It will kill the immature stages of the grasshoppers and katydids, but it is not going to kill the adults. So that's one of those things you need to use it earlier in the year when they're in that immature stage. And it is in that, the one I'm talking about there, the active ingredient of that is the Nosema locusti. And that is a bait. It's like on a, a brand matrix. And so it's going to be drawing the grasshoppers and katydids and stuff into your yard to feed on that bait product because they need to eat it. So they get a dose of the pesticide and they end up dying. So don't panic if you're using a bait and then you see a whole bunch of grasshoppers or katydids because that's what it's supposed to do. Um, as far as other products, the uh, a less toxic product would be a spinosad product. Again, that works great on anything that is chewing the foliage. <clears throat> so it would work really, really well for the immature stages. Um, anytime that you're dealing with a reduced impact or less toxic or naturally derived product, whatever you want to categorize it, they are going to work better for you when you use it on smaller stages. If you start getting, you know, an insect that's an inch, inch and a half, two, three inches for some of these katydids, it's really not going to get you the level of control that you are hoping for. I'm not saying that you can't try it. I mean, you can always give it a shot, but just don't expect it to wipe out the whole entire population. Uh, botanicals, again, for those, that's mainly going to be azadiractin um, or the pyrethrum or pyrethrins product. Uh, those are going to be broad spectrum products that will kill whatever insect comes into contact with it. And then, of course, we have synthetic contacts and systemics, which are also pretty broad spectrum on these. Um, the good thing about grasshoppers and katydids is they're usually on kind of hardier plants. I mean, they, they will essentially eat anything, but a lot of times you'll get them on plants where you can use things like vacuums to suck them off 
And again, that's going to work really better for you if you're using that in the immature stage, because if you're trying to suck up adult grasshoppers, uh, you're going to be chasing them around because they're going to be flying away from you. Aphids. These are, I would say, probably one of the number one garden and landscape pests. These are going to be small insects. They come in a variety of colors. Some of them are going to have wings. Some of them don't have wings. It just really depends on which ones you're talking about and whatnot. Um, but the key to aphids is that they have these two little tailpipe looking things that come off of the tip of the abdomen. And you can see those there. <coughs> those are called cornicles. And so if you see little kind of teardrop shaped insects, and these are gonna be again, like the spider mites, typically on the underside of the foliage, or sometimes you will see them along the stem of the plant, especially if you have like tropical milkweed, they love lining up on the stem. So these are small, soft-bodied insects. They are, in my opinion, relatively easy to kill in the sense that they're small and soft-bodied insects. They can be difficult to manage because they are crazy when it comes to reproduction. And we just did a podcast recording on aphids. I actually have to edit that this week so we can get it posted. But if you want more information about aphids, listen to our podcast and you will, um, you'll be able to learn way more than you probably ever wanted to know. And I will tell you about the new podcasts on the last slide. But aphids, to give you the, the short version, the reason why it seems like their populations are zero to billions overnight is the females do not have to mate to produce offspring. And she produces live offspring. So she's having inside of her body, she's having new baby aphids develop inside of her. And before those baby aphids even pop out of that mama aphid, they're developing aphids inside of them that they can give birth to once they come out. So it, it's like just aphid explosion, literally. It's kind of crazy. Um, so controlling aphids. Since not all of them have wings, you can use things like high pressure water sprays. That's usually my go-to when I first get aphids in my yard. Um, I leave a certain amount of aphids in my yard on a regular basis because I want to have ladybugs and lacewing larvae and all that stuff. And the aphids are going to provide them with food. So um, usually the first thing, if I see aphids, I'm looking for the predators and parasites and all of that that might be controlling those aphids. And then if I don't see those, or if I see a few of them, then I'll use a high pressure water spray. That way I'm knocking those aphids off of the plant it can damage their exoskeleton. They can be eaten by some predator that's on the ground and not necessarily on the plant. Um, you know, they might not find their way back onto the plant. So it can cut down on that population. So if that doesn't work, then I usually will go with insecticidal soap. And again, it's going to work great on things like small soft bodied insects, which aphids are certainly in that category. So it's gonna just be fine on them. You just need to make sure that you are targeting where that soap product is going. If they are on the undersurface of the leaf, you need to target the undersurface of the leaf. And then of course, you know, same thing as spider mites. Horticultural oils were, were, are going to work. You need to target where they're going to be because you have to coat the insect. And you don't really want to use horticultural oils at the hottest times of the year. Uh, botanical products, those are going to work, but target them. That way you can conserve your beneficials as much as possible. And then as far as using um, synthetic products, you can go with that, but you really don't need to. 
Uh, mealybugs and scale insects, these I lump together because mealybugs in my brain are very similar to scale insects. Um, it's just that they're capable of moving around more, but they often do not move around more. So these are all going to be oval shaped wingless insects, but mealybugs, which is what this top left picture is, they have this kind of powdery wax that coats their body. And so you can kind of see them and they're capable of walking around on the plant, but a lot of times you'll see them clustered on the stems or on the leaf ribs or whatever. With scale insects, they are very similar to that, but they will secrete a waxy covering that will cover that insect body. And sometimes it will camouflage them on the plant. So a lot of like oyster shell scales, they might get on the bark of trees and it just really blends in with the bark and it's really difficult to see them. So these like the aphids are going to have piercing sucking mouth parts. They can cause yellowing, stunting, curling. They are honeydew producers. So that can lead to a secondary issue, which is a fungus called sooty mold growing on the plants. So if you have mealybugs or scale insects, it, again, if you're monitoring and you find them when the population is first starting, you can prune that section off of the plant and dispose of that. And you have physically removed the insects or the pest problem from your plant. You do not want to dispose of it into the compost pile because you're not really going, I'm assuming that your compost pile isn't hot enough that it's going to kill those insects quickly. So I usually bag mine up um, and throw it into the garbage can. Uh, high pressure water sprays are another one. We talked about that with aphids, but this works really, really well with mealybugs and scale insects. Um, I especially like using high pressure water sprays for scale insects. Because even if you kill the, the scale insect population, that waxy covering stays on the plant until you scrape it off or it gets removed by you know, weather events or whatever. But if you use a high pressure water spray, you're not only removing that waxy covering, but you can also damage and kill the insect. And since Scale insects don't move around other than after that first stage out of the egg. You wiping them off of the plant or spraying them off the plant is essentially going to, um, you know, kind of destroy them because they don't know what to do anymore. You can use insecticidal soaps on these again on both of them. Um, it's going to essentially dissolve through that waxy covering that the scale insects and mealybugs produce and it can kill them. Uh, botanical products may work for mealybugs, but they're not really going to work very well on the scale insects because they are protected by that covering that they have over their body. White flies, oh, that's a terrible thing. Um, white flies are another small soft bodied insect with piercing sucking mouth parts it's cause yellowing, curling, stunting. They are honeydew producers, which leads to sooty mold. And these are also going to be found on the undersurface of, of So immatures are covering, but the adults are going to have wings and they are capable of flying around. So if you see something that looks like a gnat, which these aren't actually gnats, that's a completely different order. Um, if you see something that looks like a white gnat coming out from under the surface of the leaf, then you might wanna turn that leaf over and see if you have a white fly population. So these ones, uh, same sorts of controls as we've been talking about for aphids and um, mealybug insects and all that stuff. The other thing that depending on what you're using, you can, if you're planting vegetable gardens, 
You can use reflective mulches, which is kind of late now because I think everybody has their vegetable garden in right now, but you can use it for the next time. Um, a reflective mulch is a shiny material that is flexible and you would put that down over the plot of land and then you poke holes in it and you plant your vegetables in there. And what that does is it reflects the light onto the underside of the leaf and it makes it a less habitable location for things like white flies or aphids or mealy bugs to kind of hang out. So um, it can help cut down on those populations that you may encounter. Hoppers, um, I lumped all these together because there's 80 bajillion of them. There's tree hoppers, there's plant hoppers, there's leaf hoppers, there's sharpshooters, which are a type of hopper. And these are another one. They have piercing, sucking mouth parts. They cause yellowing, stunting, curling. They are honeydew producers. And this is a the same kind of management that you would be doing for the other ones, but it's usually a little trickier because most people since these are so small, they usually don't notice issues until they see the adult stages. And that's really difficult to manage those because they are going to have wings and they are capable of flying away. The kind of exception to that rule is this one right here, which is kind of a poor picture of the insect. But if you see what looks like spit on plants, if you dig inside of there, you'll actually find a insect that is called a spittle bug. And so this is um, an immature one of these hopper insects. And then the bottom one I do want to mention, this one right here is a sharpshooter. These ones generally don't cause enough damage to the plants directly by feeding on them but they are known to transmit a bunch of different viruses. So that is why you would want to target controlling them if you see them in the landscape. Stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs. These are larger insects than the ones that we've been talking about with piercing sucking mouth parts so far. Um, but they do have piercing sucking mouth parts, but these are usually not feeding on foliage. They can feed on foliage, but usually these are going to feed on fruits and nuts and seeds. So a lot of times like pecans or sunflowers or tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, things like that. And these are going to feed in both the immature and the adult stages. And it depends on what they're feeding on. If it's foliage, then they're going to cause yellowing and curling of the foliage. But if it's fruit, you can see the damage that they cause. It's going to be yellow kind of spotty appearance. You can still eat it. It just doesn't look as nice as we hope the stuff coming out of our gardens does. So with these, um, your control methods are really, again, very similar to the grasshopper and Katie did. It's going to be dependent upon what stage you are trying to manage. If you are trying to manage the adult stage, which you see in these pictures here, then I would recommend probably going with a vacuum of some sort or you can wear gloves and hand pick them and dump them into a bucket of soapy water. The other options, if you're killing the immature stages, one, you can look for the eggs. They look like little, um, for stink bugs, they look like little beer kegs that are clustered together. And for leaf footed bugs, they look like little half beer cans or soda cans or whatever that are kind of in a line. So either one of those, you can squish the eggs. You can um, use insecticidal soap or some of the botanical products on the immature stages. But once you get to the adult stage, you're either gonna have to go with a more potent pesticide or you can go with vacuuming or hand picking. The good thing with these, um, I'm assuming you guys aren't in like cotton fields or anything like that where you would have tons and tons of stink bugs. If you're just talking about your back garden, 
you usually don't have a ton of stuff that hand picking would be completely outrageous. Moving into the turf. We have the chinch bugs, which, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that that text is pretty much illegible. Um, chinch bugs, they are small insects. They're maybe about a 16th of an inch. They are black and white in color. The immatures are going to be more of like a pinkish peachy color. And they are going to be feeding on the turf, the turf blades in both the, the immature and the adult stages. And they're gonna cause this kind of brown patchy turf that you see over here. So you have your dead grass, you kind of have your halo of yellow grass that's around that. And then you have, have the grass that they haven't gotten to yet that's perfectly fine. So when you look for chinch bugs or when I look for chinch bugs, all I do is I in the grass and I start kind of digging around with my hands and I'm looking for those chinch bugs walking around. And it, it just makes it easy. There are other people that use what's called the coffee can method where you get a uh, metal can. That's why it's a coffee can, but you know, I don't think any coffee comes in metal cans anymore. Um, some sort of a large metal can, cut out both sides of it, kind of screw it down into the ground and fill it with water and you look for the chinch bugs floating to the top. I don't do that because, well, one, I don't have a can like that and I wouldn't want to carry one around with me all the time when I have to go look for chinch bugs. Um, as far as management with chinch bugs, there's not a whole lot of different varying options. Usually uh, you may be able to find a naturally derived product that comes in a spray form that you would maybe attach to the end of a garden hose. I know they have synthetic versions, um, but they should have some um, plant-based versions as well. And you would just attach that and you want to spray in the area where you're seeing the damage. You don't have to treat the whole entire lawn unless you know your whole entire lawn is infested. So the other option is going to be using a granular product that you would put out with a push spreader, kind of like that you put out with fertilizer. But with that, you need to make sure that you are watering that product in. If you do not water in that granular pesticide, it is essentially going to sit there in a little pellet on the ground and it's not releasing pesticide to kill the insects. That water is going to cause those little pesticide pellets to dissolve and it spreads out over the grass at that point and it can come into contact with those insects and kill them. Chinch bugs are, again, they can be active spring through fall, but they are most prevalent at hotter, drier times of the year. And so we usually see a lot of chinch bug damage in the summertime, like kind of mid to late summer is when we really start having uh, damage caused by these. And a lot of times their damage is going to start near a driveway or a sidewalk or something that is going to be wicking a lot of the moisture out of the soil or the turf at, in that particular area. So this is the other one that can cause brown patchy turf. These are going to be the white grubs and these are gonna be damaging in the immature stage. So the, the Mayan June beetles are gonna be hitting real soon. I've been seeing a few of them sporadically but we haven't really had the, the massive amount that we normally do. So prepare yourselves, it's coming. The adults really aren't an issue other than just being annoying because they are terrible flyers and they kind of bonk into you and just kind of makes things difficult when you're sitting outside and there's June bugs flying into you. The immatures on the other hand, which are these creamy white C-shaped larvae, see they have the head capsule with mandibles and then the legs they feed on the roots of turf. And so 
if you have a significant population of them in a turf area, they can cause damage. Uh, sometimes you may not necessarily see the white grubs themselves. It may be that you're having armadillos digging up your yard or you have a bunch of grackles in one particular area. That might be a sign that you have a problem with white grubs. So depending upon what type of product you are using, you need to make sure that you time your treatment correctly. So we do have systemic products that can be used on turf to control these. And when a systemic works and you put that out, it's going to be taken into the plant tissue. So when that grub feeds on the roots of the turf, it gets a dose of that pesticide and it will kill it. So that one you can put out in the spring and it's gonna kill those grubs that start feeding on it once they hatch out of the eggs. If you're using a contact pesticide, whether that is a synthetic contact or it's something that is naturally derived, you have to time it properly. And that's really going to vary on, you know, where you are in Texas. Here in Central Texas, we're usually talking mid-July, but again, it really depends on when they emerge. I mean, by now in most years, we have May and June bugs coming out the wazoo. They're everywhere. But I think that freeze kind of paused everything for a while and they're taking a couple more weeks. So this may get pushed instead of kind of that late, mid to late July treatment, it might push us into August. So what we're aiming for is six to eight weeks after the heaviest flights of the beetles. So what we're doing is we're allowing those beetles to emerge out of the ground, mate, lay eggs, and then we're waiting for those eggs to hatch out. So we want to get the smaller instars of the larvae after, that are coming out of the egg because they're not only smaller, so smaller is easier to kill, but they're also closer to the soil surface. With white grubs, they not only get larger as they mature, but they also go further down into the ground. So it gets very difficult to get that pesticide down to where they're located. Caterpillars. This, I want to say, is the spring for caterpillars. I have had so many questions about caterpillars, all different kinds of caterpillars, and we have two on this slide that I've been getting lots of questions on. So this one up here, if you haven't seen it, which, you know, they've died off by now, which is, well, actually, they haven't died off by now. They have pupated by now. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Um, these are the spring canker worms. These are the ones that were dangling from the little silken strands from the oak trees, covering everything with silk and just being annoying. They have gone to the ground and pupated and they only have one generation per year. So you don't have to worry about them until next year sometime, which is good. The other one that I have been seeing and getting tons and tons of calls on are these ones right here. These are the forest temp caterpillars, which if you look at, you know, that is a very beautiful caterpillar. It's like this real pretty blue and they have these little white keyhole shaped markings on them. They got some like yellowy stripes on the side. Very, very pretty. And they are, the, the ones I have are in my oak trees out front. They've been going crazy. Fortunately, um, they are starting to pupate. I found some pupil cases in my yard last week. So these are starting to pupate as well, but these will have multiple generations throughout the year. These are all going to be foliage feeders. So all caterpillars are going to feed on some type of foliage. Some of them are very specific about what families of plants they will feed on. Others are more broad in that they'll pretty much eat whatever. So when we're dealing with caterpillars, this is another one. If you are trying to kill a canker worm that gets maybe an inch when it's fully grown, it's going to be pretty easy to kill that with some of the naturally derived products. 
But if you're trying to kill a hornworm that's getting like three or four inches when it's fully grown, you're not gonna do much with them when you're trying to treat them chemically. So keep that in mind. A lot of these caterpillars are going, while they feed on foliage, uh, they may not do enough damage really to warrant you trying to control them, especially if they are in trees that are mature. I know that our trees got stressed out with the freeze that we've had, um, but the caterpillars, even with the caterpillars that we had, it's not enough to really cause a lot of issues. It's more of a nuisance and you know them being irritating when they land on your head when you're sitting underneath the tree. So as far as treatment for these, if you catch the caterpillars when they are in the very TT tiny immature stages, you can use things like insecticidal soap. Otherwise, my go-to for caterpillar treatment is going to be a Bacillus thuringiensis Kerstaki product. So BT Kerstaki, it is going to target only caterpillars. It does have to be consumed for it to work, but it is going to kill only caterpillars. It will leave all of the other insects. That being said, it does not know what caterpillars you want to eat it and die and what caterpillars you don't want to eat it and die. So if you have a butterfly garden in your yard or you're trying to conserve some specific whatever, be very careful if you're using BT Kerstaki because it will kill those caterpillars that you might be wanting to raise into swallowtails or something. All right, so these are the books that I would probably suggest for you if you wanted more information on insects. This one right here, Garden Insects of North America, um, has tons and tons and tons of information in it, a lot of great pictures. And this is in its second edition now. The original one was just by Whitney Cranshaw. This one has added Dave Shetler on it, which he was one of my professors way back when I was an undergraduate in entomology. He's a super, super cool guy. Um, but this is a great book and you can get this for probably about $25 new um, which is a bargain, we see the book. And then this one on the right-hand side, it just came out, I think in March. So this is by John and Kendra Abbott. If you guys know the Abbots, they are excellent photographers. And so they are uh, lots of great pictures in here, but it's common insects of Texas and surrounding states. So, you know, if you want something specific to Texas, this is going to be your jam and it's but it's not targeting only stuff that you might find in your garden whereas this one is targeted more towards that and then i think you guys know all of this over here the new stuff or i guess relatively new stuff <laughs> i have a youtube channel that i do little short kind of one minute video clips about different insects so if you go to YouTube and you type in Wizzy Brown, you should be able to find my channel and those videos. And then the latest and greatest is that I am doing two different podcasts with my colleagues. Bugs by the Yard is myself, Molly Keck, and Dr. Irfan Bafai, which I believe you guys know all of those people. Um, but we're talking about bugs that you can find in your yard. So that one has several episodes out already. And we're not talking just pests there. We're talking about any bug that you can find in your yard, whether it's beneficial or a pest or just kind of happens to be there. And then the second one that I'm doing, this one is myself, Molly Keck, Janet Hurley, who heads up the school IPM program for the state of Texas. And then also Dr. Robert Puckett, who deals a lot with the pest control industry. So unwanted guests is essentially about any of the pests that may uh, join you in your home. So um, that one just had its first episode released, I think last week. Yeah, last week, so the beginning of May. 
Um, so those are the new ones and they are streaming on iTunes um, or whatever platform you, you listen to podcasts on you. If you type in the name of them, it should pull them up. So I'm going to leave that up and go into chat. And let's see. Do, 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 do. Put this down there. Do chinch bugs prefer a specific grass like St. Augustine? Um, chinch bugs do prefer St. Augustine but that does not mean that they will not get on other types of grasses. When I lived in Manor, I had a all Bermuda grass lawn and it got decimated by chinch bugs. I mean, it was, it was so bad of a outbreak that they were literally crawling up the side of the house. It was crazy. There are, if you are putting in turf or buying turf to do a lawn, then you can um, buy resistant varieties of turf grass. But again, resistant does not mean that you will never ever have problems with them. It just means that you are less likely. The blue caterpillars are forest tent caterpillars. And that's all the Questions? Really? Come on, y'all. You can either type a question or you can unmute and ask. Either way is fine. Or am I, have I been talking and nobody's here anymore? Hey, Wizzy. Yes. Uh, one of the tree people suggested, because I have so many aphids on my oak tree, suggested I get a product and I put it around the ground to, and it would soak up into the tree and kill my aphids? Be, uh -huh. I guess, How, that, that's going to be a systemic. So it's going to be like an imidacloprid product. How big are your oak trees that we're talking about? Oh, the base is probably 24, 28 inches in diameter. I mean, around the bottom. So if you're doing a systemic drench, it's going to go maybe 12, 15 feet up the tree. So if your canopy is higher than that, it's really not going to do a whole lot for you. And if you have a mature oak tree, those aphids, while they dropping honeydew on you and whatnot, they're really not damaging the tree unless you have like huge populations. I personally, if it were me and oak trees that I had in my front yard, I would take the pressure washer and I would just spray it up there or the garden hose even. And well, I do that with a fire nozzle. Yeah. And just knock them out that way. Okay. Well, All one right. of my How... questions was, I was wondering if that chemical, because I have flowers planted down near the tree, would uh -huh. that hurt my uh, beneficials and my uh, butterflies? If you have stuff? trees or any plants that are underneath those trees, it's going to also take up the systemic right. and it's going to be in the plant. So if you know pollinators or something like that come to those flowers then they could also pick up that product and cause it could cause issues that's what i thought okay thank you yeah um does bt hurt ladybugs no it only targets caterpillars uh is it normal for ants to be on a tree would the ants kill a cypress tree would the ants kill a cypress tree no is it normal for ants to be on a tree? Maybe. So there are, it, there are different types of ants that you might see on a tree. If you see carpenter ants, which are the larger, sometimes they're black, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're a reddish brown. They're larger, but they are going to be nesting in dead wood that is rotting. So if you have a dead branch on the tree or, you know, a tree hole or something, you might see carpenter ants or even sometimes acrobat ants in that particular um, area because they're living in that rotting wood. 
the other chance that you might see ants on the tree, and this could be a plethora of ants, is if you have something like aphids, ladybugs, or white flies, or whatever up in the tree, are going up there and they're tending to those insects for the honeydew. So they will go up and they'll groom that insect and that insect will pop out a little droplet of honeydew and they will then eat that as, you know, it's like a sugar source for them. So a lot of times you'll see them going up in the tree to tend those types of insects. Uh, let's see, I saw something about bed bugs. How can you get rid of bed bugs? Um, it depends on how bad your population is and how thorough you are in doing specific tasks. If you have a then I would say that you could treat that yourself. You can vacuum up those bed bugs. You could use a steamer <clears throat> in that area after you vacuum up the bed bugs to clean any, or not clean, but to kill any of the eggs that might be there. Um, and then you could also use a pesticide that is labeled for whatever you're treating because there are going to be pesticides for bed bugs that you can use on certain types of furniture. And then there are others that you cannot. So you definitely need to check your label. If you have a huge population of bed bugs in one room or you have them in multiple locations around your house, I would probably recommend that you contact a pest management professional. Because in that case, you know, there's really going to be more of a treatment. And, you know, some of those companies may do uh, a chemical only treatment. Some of them may do a heat treatment. Some of them may do a mix. Um, if you're a hoarder and they can't go in and actually treat anything, then they might recommend that you get a fumigation done. It, it just really, it depends on the situation. So when you have a bed bug population, uh, I really, if, if it's to the point where you're contacting pest control companies, I would say make sure that you get quotes from more than one company that you are going to compare what you're getting with the amount of money that you're paying. So the cheapest may not be the best one for you to go with. And if they're quoting you the exact price that it's gonna be over the phone, then you might want to reconsider because like I said, if you have 10 bed bugs in one room, you know, that's going to be a real easy thing. And that might be a lower cost, but if they're all over your house and your house is 2000 square feet, then that's not going to be the same cost as that one room should be, or it shouldn't be. So it may not be a, uh, something that they can quote you. I, I don't think it's something that they can quote you over the phone. The ants have a black and red body. The black part is a triangle shape. Uh, those are going to be acrobat ants then if they're um, tinier ants. And those are just living in uh, the damaged wood. So if you remove the whatever branch is dead, then that will get rid of them. And if you want to know more about acrobat ants, you know, shameless plug here. I do have uh, two videos on acrobat ants on my YouTube channel. So you can learn more about them and you can see what they look like. Um, I have hydrangeas with pin size holes all over. I'm assuming in the foliage. If that is the case, um, you probably have um, a flea beetle of some sort because Flea beetle damage, they're like little tiny uh, holes in the foliage. And it, it looks like something like you took a shotgun and you just shot it at the plant and all those little pellets kind of went through the foliage. So look for little tiny beetles. They could be different um, colors. Some of them are green, some are black, some are various colors. But they will have enlarged hind legs that they use for jumping. 
And a lot of times when you're messing around with the plant looking for them, they fall to the ground and play dead. So you may not see them. But if you still have the insects on the plant and they're continuing to damage it, then you could use a spinosad product on the hydrangea and that would work for anything that is eating that foliage. Does honeydew from bugs look like black sticky dots? No, honeydew is a clear liquid substance that they exude as a waste. And when it lands on the surface of the plant, it's just kind of a shiny thing and then it'll dry on there. So you kind of get that shiny sticky surface. The black part that you're seeing is either other insects that are pooping. Um, a lot of times caterpillar poop is mistaken for other things. Um, or the black dots parts of it could be the start of a sooty mold infestation on that honeydew. So sooty mold is a fungus that grows on honeydew. So if you're seeing sooty mold on your plants, that's really not the main issue that you need to deal with. You need to find the insect that is causing the honeydew that is growing the sooty mold. Any advice for plum curculio on peach trees? Um, there is a publication. Teresa, can you email me and I will send you the stone fruit guide from A&M because they have a whole booklet thing. If you have uh, peach trees, there's probably more than plum curculio that you need to know about. <laughs> and I think, I don't know if it's still up or not. I did a um, fruit tree pest thing, I think in January, maybe it was February. I don't know, it's all blending. It may or may not still be up on um, Zoom. I don't know, but shoot me an email and I will send that to you. All right, that was the last question in chat. Anybody else got anything? I do. This is Laura. Yes. Okay, I read some stuff about um, grub treatment. Don't be surprised, Ms. Kate, that there's preventative and curative treatments. And that was a Michigan State EDU um, publication. I thought it was real interesting. And it starts talking about imdacloprin versus uh, all these different kinds of poisons and when to do them and which instar and I don't know. What do you think about those different kinds of- Well, poisons? your first problem is going to Michigan and I talking know. about uh, or listening to them about the white grubs because their cycles are going to be so different than ours because of the uh, winters that they have. Um, my parents live in Ohio and my mom said that it was like 30 degrees the other day. So um, it's one of those things that their life cycles are going to be so different than ours are down here. And they have a uh, different species. So their controls are gonna be a little bit different. If you're talking about preventative control, you're gonna go with a systemic imidacloprid product that will get taken into the turf. If you're going with a contact, then that is just gonna get put out whenever like that six to eight weeks after the heaviest flights. So um, you can go to, I think it's aggieturf.tamu.edu yeah. or something like that. Or again, on Bugs by the Yard, we have a two-part episode. One of them is already out. The other one I think comes out either this week or next week. And we actually talk with Dr. Becky Grubbs, who is a turf specialist out of the Dallas Center. And we're talking all about turf insects. So that would be another good place that you can get good information. Thanks. Uh-huh. Any dog friendly go-to for fire ants aside from boiling hot water? Yes, uh, I would say Fire ant baits are certainly dog friendly. I have um, three dogs and three cats and my cats are indoors. So the fire ants don't really bother them. But 
Um, the dogs definitely are an uh, issue, but I use fire ant bait. My, the bait that I use has two active ingredients. It has methoprene and hydromethanolon. And essentially when you're using a fire ant bait, you put your animals in, you go outside, you get your handheld spreader, you spread the bait over the whole entire yard, and then you can put the dogs back out. And that's pretty much, you're done. And the ants do the work for you with fire ant bait. So they pick up that bait as a food, they carry it back, they share it with the other ants in the colony, and they end up, you know, themselves off. So it works really, really well. Um, mosquito control. Whew, that could be like an entire presentation in itself. <laughs> so um, the, the quick version of mosquito control, um, reduce standing water. If you cannot get rid of your standing water, then treat your water either with a BT Israeliensis, which are like the dunk products, or um, put fish in the water or use some sort of an oil or soap product that is for mosquito control on the surface, but that can, you know, cause issues for other animals that might be living in that water too. So make sure you read your label. Um, mosquito control also, um, the four D's. So we have drain, which is what we just talked about. Dress, you want to wear light colored clothing uh, that is loose fitting and long sleeve, long pants. Drain, dress, uh, da, 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 da. what's the other one? There, uh, of course, defend. So you want mosquito repellent when you go outside. And there is a EPA site that you can go to that will help you choose the best mosquito repellent for whatever. And again, if you want a link sent to you for that uh, EPA site, shoot me an email and I will send you that link. I see somebody on there, the Thermacell products work great for mosquitoes. I completely agree with you. I just got the latest model of the Thermacell to try out. It is, um, I think it's like the third generation product, but it gives a, a larger area that it covers. This one covers like 20 feet diameter. And um, it's also rechargeable, so you don't have to deal with those little propane canisters. Uh, bug zappers, I do not recommend bug zappers uh, for mosquitoes. Um, while they will kill mosquitoes that come into contact with them, research, I think out of Florida, has shown that they actually kill more beneficial insects than they do mosquitoes. So again, bug zappers are going to kill whatever is attracted to that light source. Um, how to get rid of chiggers. Um, that one is going to be, you could use sulfur product. Um, you could definitely use miticides, but a lot of, a lot of that is going to be landscaping modification. So you don't want low lying areas. You want to keep the landscape in good condition, making sure that you're mowing the grass um, and keeping it low. So the sunlight can kind of penetrate and not allow those mite populations to build up. Um, again, if you know that you're going into an area as chiggers, wear a repellent of some sort. And then you also want to tuck your pants into your socks. So it makes it more difficult for them to kind of get up, I guess, onto your skin. Anybody else? I'm going to say that that is a no. Good job, Rizzy. Looks <laughs> like you've done a good job again, so. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Nobody else has any questions. I've got, it's 8.05, so we will end the program. All right.
Bye everyone. Give me an email if you have any more questions that you think of while you're sleeping or whatnot. Have a good night. Thanks, Wizzy. Well, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.